Hello YouTube, this is Morgan Airspeed Prime here with my next Avatar comic review. This is going to be my full spoiler review for Toph Beifong's Metal Bending Academy, the new Avatar one-shot comic that is out today. So this is the second Avatar one-shot after Katara and the Pirate Silver, and this one's going to be followed up in uh, June by Suki alone and that will complete our first trilogy of one shots that have the theme of the awesome ladies of avatar so female characters as the focus of these three stories um, so yeah I've already talked about this book I did a non-spoiler review back in December because I got an early review copy of this book so I think the main thing to say about my sort of non-spoiler review here and my thoughts is that obviously they have changed a little bit because I have had two months to reflect on this book. Um, so the new factor has worn off, I suppose, at this point. And the main thing that I think that's accomplished is just that I don't think this book is like that much better than Katara and the Pirate Silver. It's a it's an improvement. It's a noted improvement over Guitar and the Pirate Silver, but it's it's still not quite where I think we need to be with the quality of the one shots. The problem, and I've been saying this for a while now, and this includes like Imbalance and North and South to a to a degree. Um, what has happened to the comics' ability to actually cover like notable content? Because the novels right now it seems like are just a sort of one-off thing. Two novels happened and there's no news about any other novels. The, the Yeah, there's rumors and there may be hope for a third series, but until that happens we don't really know what the situation is. So Dark Horse Comics are the ones who give us our new Avatar story content. And in my mind it's been quite a few years since we last covered something important happening in the comics and the years just go on and on the gaps between story content just grows and grows in the sense that Mei and Zuko have now been broken up for what eight nine years the last time we saw Mei and Zuko together in a comic was five six years ago uh, and it's the same for the last Azula appearance in one of the comics five six years ago and this is not helping. This switch to one shots, which was something they announced obviously a few months ago as a specific thing that they decided to do. Mike and Brian apparently were the ones who made this decision to move the Avatar comics from the trilogies continuing the story to these sandbox style one shot comics. And in my mind, two comics in, it hasn't really worked. It hasn't really accomplished anything because the stories haven't accomplished anything. Uh, it's been a couple of months since Guitar and the Pirate Silver. I haven't felt the need to really read it again because there's nothing of substance in it. There's no real reason to go back to it. It's a fun comic. It's fine. Um, the art is nice, but you know what? What of importance really happens in this? With just the scope of that story, the planning behind it, where they decided to set it. It just it didn't give them any room to do anything with this is a bit better because at least it's set during the comic timeline. I still think it's a problem that we're seemingly not able to do stories anymore where it continues the story and I don't know what the reason behind that is. That just locks us in to what we can do in a different sort of way. Um, so obviously this one is set like after the rift um, and that's all they've really said about it uh, in terms of the timeline and that seems to be roughly where it is. It helps to explain a few things in terms of the changes with the academy from the rift into potentially the thing the way things are better like the students being in a higher position by the time they're reintroduced in north and south. It does a few things like that but in the grand scheme of things I don't think there's any particular takeaway from the book. So th the main thing that I didn't talk about in the non-spoiler review, because I felt it was the only real spoiler in the book, which again, came out in the Google Books preview pages, so everyone sort of knew about it, is that this book introduces us to a new lava bender. So obviously lava bending, very, very cool ability. It's this rare ability that seems to be a bloodline ability. You have to be born with the inherent ability to lava bend. You can't just learn it. Um, so that makes it special. And that's cool. And I, and I think it adds a bit of intrigue and interest to this book. 
but I think it sort of masks over some problems in this book that they have this <clears throat> cool factor behind, you know, there's a Lava Bender character here, look at this character, uh, this uh, young guy who, you know, is, is participating in the pro in the underground bending tournaments to earn money, and he's a Lava Bender, but he can't really control his abilities, and this draws Toph's attention. What they do is that by the end of the book, Toph decides that she has to offer him and his friends who are Earthbenders a place in her academy. Now, her academy is a metal bending academy, none of them are metal benders. That's a different approach for the academy, and she makes the decision. She's going to sort of switch it to just be a place for earth benders in general, of all skill sets, to come and learn and train uh, in a very sort of constructive, helpful environment, so that up, up and coming earth benders don't have to learn their skills in the same way that she did. You know, the, she is sort of defined by the way she had to learn her skills from the Badger Moles and then utilizing them in practice during the Earth Rumble uh, fights, of course. She feels that, you know, that doesn't work for everyone, so I'll use the Academy as a way to bring everyone in and help people out. And that's nice. That is really good. But to say that this is like bridging the gap between Avatar and Korra, I don't think quite fits because what needs to be bridged with Toph in between the series is how does she become a, a, a cop? How does she become the chief of police? When does that happen at all? Because in Korra, we don't really get a sense for that, like, oh, she has a metal bending academy, that really. Um, but she, that's the focus of the comics. So the comics haven't really focused on why she necessarily would go into law enforcement, and Korra doesn't really focus on the fact that she had a metal bending academy, so how do you connect those things together? And this, in my mind, like doesn't really help all that much. I, I'd say about the only thing right now that just the introduction of this lava bender accomplishes is that now the group has met a lava bender and is more familiar with other specialized forms of bending to help to inform what Sokka says during, say, Yakone's trial. That he knows about metal bending, combustion bending, lava bending, and, you know, blah, and so on. That, you know, skills are more than just the basic elements. Uh, that, that's basically the point here. But I'd say actually the problem with the lava bending subplot is that the book ends with Sun just joining the academy. We get no training whatsoever. Yet, Toph literally says the line, like, I will teach you to be a real lava bender. And that's a really interesting statement, but do you, watching this video, do you have any confidence that they are going to come back to the character of Sun and explore him being trained as a lava bender? I don't, because in an interview just pretty recently, Faith Aaron Hicks basically just said, in response to a direct question about will you ever do a sequel to this story? No, it's a one-shot. <laughs> so, uh, that's just baffling to me in terms of, like, that's the truly interesting thing I take away from this book, is that, like, I would love to see Toph trying to teach someone an ability that she doesn't have, but utilizing the fact that she is a top-level bender, one of the best benders in the world. Could she help a lava bender learn a skill set that she doesn't really know much about herself? That's really, really interesting, but this book doesn't cover that. It just leaves you with the tease of it's going to happen off screen and you're not going to know anything about it. And that immediately just means, like, okay, then what was the point in a way? Um, other than just having a cool thing. Like, I like how Peter Wortman draws lava bending, there's some really cool stuff here. There's a nice fight between Sun and this kind of big waterbender guy that I think some of the bending moves and the way the choreography goes is really, really nice. And I'd love to see, you know, him write a more meaningful bending fight, I think. And, and, and that's just the way I feel about this book is just that it's fine. It's good. It's fun. There's a bit of solid character development for Toph and the students and, like, Sun is interesting enough. But... These pages, these 72 pages, these valuable pages, one of the, I guess, three books we're potentially going to get this year, could have been used to do something so much more important. 
with Toph as a character to actually explore her in between the series. But they, they seem unwilling to do this. There seems to be a crippling lack of ambition with the comics at this point in time. And it goes back to what I said. Of like, it's been years since we've actually covered anything of note in the comics. Um, and I don't know what the direction is. Especially when it's come from Mike and Brian, apparently, this switch. Now, I will say, Suki alone looks like it is going to be a massive improvement. That looks like I think it will fit a lot more in line with what fans actually want. Because we want Suki to have more attention. We want Suki to have more important roles in the comics. And it looks like they're going to fill in a gap that actually needs to be filled in. Because, one other thing I'll say about this book is that Suki's in this. Sokka and Suki are in this book. It was one of the sort of the marketing points is that Sokka, Suki and Chong are in this book. I don't think you get that much content from Sokka and Suki out of this because it's so clear that their role in this book is literally just to introduce Toph to Chong. That Sokka isn't here because we're going to do anything with Sokka. Suki isn't here because we're necessarily going to do anything of note with Suki. They are literally just here to have characters who are familiar with Chong in different ways. And then to cut to Toph interacting with Chong and her getting her first interaction with him. Because again, he was introduced prior to Toph joining the team. So she never actually met him. And this is her learning about him for the first time. And I appreciate that. I, I, I like Chang as, a, as a, one of the mo more notable minor characters. And he plays his role nicely within this story. But again, it comes down to the scope of this book, the ambition of this book. And it's not with where I think it needs to be. The other factor in that is that we're in 2021. The year after Avatar had a big resurgence last year, the amount of new merchandise that's coming in, all these different companies grabbing the Avatar uh, license to make new merchandise, it feels like Avatar is having this big comeback. Yet Dark Horse is probably at their weakest point for story content uh, since they started the comics, basically. And I don't get how that has happened, how that has managed to happen. Now, to be fair, if they would just ever announce the next Korra comic, I think opinions would, you know, even out and there'd be a little bit more like, okay, they're kind of taking a bit of a break with Avatar comics, but at least the Korra, Korra comics are going on. But the problem is that, would you ever announce the Korra comic? Like, it's, it's nearly a year of, like, vague teasing about the next Korra comic. Uh, because this month is a year since the last uh, part of uh, Runes of the Empire. Please just announce it and finally give us something to get excited about. So uh, there's that. So Sokka and Suki are really only in this book at the very start. And Sokka is just there to play his typical role of he was the one who probably had the biggest dynamic with Chong in terms of just being annoyed by him. That continues. Suki is now revealed to know Chong through his music because he's really popular now and she's a huge fan of his music. So Suki is a fangirl, literally, in this uh, book um, for Chong. But outside of just her being really happy to go to their concert, that's their involvement in the book. The whole middle section of the book doesn't feature Sokka and Suki. They come back right at the end and it feels like they are just sort of included there because they were at the start, like to have this conversation between like multiple characters. Um, but that's really all it is. It's just that Chong is making this decision. Suki as a fan of the band is sort of cares about that decision. And that's really it. There's no development for Suki, there's no development for Sokka. It's ultimately a Toph and Chong book with a little bit of sun shown, uh, thrown in. And like, I, I appreciate the attempt and stuff like that. I still think Faith Erin Hicks has the potential to be a really, really good Avatar writer. But until she writes content that I think is important, that really affects the Avatar kind of universe in a big way, um, I, I don't really know how I meant to feel about it because is it just the case of she came on board as a writer of the comics at the point at which they transitioned away from doing more notable content and it's just a situation where Gene Yang happened to be the writer at the point at which they were being more ambitious with their stories and she is now the writer when they're not really doing that and that's the main contrast. Uh, that, that's where I'm not sure about it and so until we see her commit to doing something more notable it's hard to say um if 
this is what we need for the future of the franchise. Um, now, again, going back to the interview I mentioned, she did finally mention that she would actually like to ride Azula going forward as potentially, I suppose, one of these future one-shots. I don't think that confirms it is what the next one is, but it is a massive contrast to what she said previously about Azula and that she's basically borderline afraid to write the character because of what the fans might say about her portrayal of Azula. But now she's saying she will do it. Maybe the timing you can question a little bit of just like, oh, you're willing to write Azula now that the comics are locked into doing these one shots and you're not allowed to do important content. That all of a sudden, you know, puts everything up into question where it's just like, oh, do we want a Azula equivalent story like this? I'm kind of like, yes, just to get Azula content, but why can't we get the follow-up to Smoke and Shadow and, and cover what's next for Azula. Why can't we cover that major character arc that we really want to see? I don't really know. But, um, and, and this is where like I will praise her writing actually a little bit, in that this book I think had the potential to fall into the trap that some Toph content can fall into, which is just that Toph is tough, she is the best bender ever, that you literally just write her to just beat up a bunch of people and that's it, end of day. That's the story. I appreciate the restraint that that doesn't happen here. It looks like it's going to happen at a certain point in the book, but then all of a sudden, Toph's reputation of being a part of Team Avatar and because of that sort of allied in a way with the Earth King and stuff like that means she has sort of become part of the establishment and isn't really the blind bandit rebel participating in the illicit bending tournaments anymore. She can't have that reputation anymore because she is the leader of a respected bending school. She is, you know, involved in the Earth and Fire Refinery, this very important company, and is a noted figure within the world as a sort of hero who is, you know, part of the Avatar's team. She can't go back to the way things were. And so that limits what she can do. She can't just participate in the uh, underground bending tournaments. And that actually creates a bit of an interesting situation of just the contrast between the way things were for her before versus the way they are now. And uh, that she feels almost wasted despite her success. That her, her school is doing really, really well. So incredible. No problems whatsoever. But she feels that she should do more because she has done more eventful things in the past. Being a part of Team Avatar and I suppose how her initial training went to become such a powerful bender. Um, and, and, and that's where I, I do like the core point of this book of Toph re revealing basically the more emotional side behind why she started up a, a, a bending academy that it was to help out people. It was so that people didn't have to take such a crazy approach to doing things uh, to become a bender. And they contrast that with the students who feel that, oh, Toph is in a bit of a bad mood about things. Is it because we're not good enough and we haven't trained in the same way that she's trained in bending? So they enter the underground bending tournaments because they feel they need to do things the way Toph did to gain her respect. Now, ultimately, it just puts them in the position to be the, the sort of help save the day when Sun's lava bending takes down some of the building structure that they're in. And so the metal benders come in very handy to keep the structure up. And it's this real, you know, they prove themselves in the middle of the action that they're incredibly skilled benders. The book already makes it clear that they are training a lot of the new recruits to metal bending and effectively getting across the idea that we're, we're like this close to basically like we have metal bending master number two, three, and four within the Avatar universe. And that's cool. This book definitely makes it clear that, you know, having the very basic view on these students that they're still the exact same as the promise is not really valid. They have grown since then. I think the second we got their second appearance in the Rift, we knew that they were more nuanced characters. And this is just a book that sort of reflects on that and makes it clear that they have all changed. Uh, Hotun doesn't just talk about, you know, doom and is afraid of everything anymore. 
Topanga isn't just obsessed with like boys and like buying things and stuff like that. And the Dark One isn't so like dramatic as he al already is. They're all more nuanced characters because of their training and they value being teachers, being part of the academy. And they get that respect by the end of the book. Toph doesn't call them lily livers anymore, she calls them by their names. And I guess that shows that respect. She now views them as effectively being metal bending masters as well. And, and I do like appreciate that. But I feel that the development just from like the rift into north and south made that kind of clear enough. That this is just sort of, you know, retelling us something that we already knew, even though it's 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 pretty nicely done. So um let, let's get to some of the sort of key points here. I have a, I only ended up bookmarking about three pages from this book in terms of anything of like substance, um, which I think is maybe telling about just, I don't really think there's all that much to this. So when Toph and Chong, this is probably the main character side of things for Toph in the book, is that Toph and Chong end up meeting at nighttime after the, um, the show that they go to. Chong's trying to avoid all of his fans so he can get a bit of a relaxation and Toph wants to know what's going on with the, you know, the unusual bender that she's encountered. And she talks, they end up getting into a conversation about just, you know, their approaches, you know, uh, Toph and how she feels her bending talents is perhaps being wasted in the situation that she's in, and Chong ends up talking about how uh, he feels he's lost some of his passion for music now that it's sort of this thing that earns him money. So Toph says, I'm proud of Beifong Metal Bending Academy, but why does my life feel so routine? Why do I feel like my bending abilities aren't being challenged? I'm not inventing new bending techniques or saving the world. I'm just teaching bender kids how to do their stances day after day. Meanwhile, there are kids out in the streets of Yudao discovering bending techniques I've never seen before. Last night, a kid did something that looked like he combined fire bending and earth bending. It was amazing. That used to be me, but now I'm part of the establishment. Um, and Chong goes on to explain that, you know, he, he uh, Lily and Moku, they did music just for the love of the music. They just liked playing. But then they started to be able to learn earn a living, earn money from playing their music. And, you know, he's happy that it's able to, like, his music is able to touch people. But he feels he has lost something in the progress and in the process of that. And they, they just covered this like moment where after the show, he saw this guy just play music out in the street and he felt like that's some of the best music he's ever heard. This guy wasn't playing music to make money, but it's, it's sort of, that's what he's missing and he wants to be able to go back to that. But they sort of twist it around a little bit and think that like, oh, maybe Chong should just stop making money from music. But then there's this kind of counterpoint and it's just like, I don't want to stop because there's one thing great about getting paid for our music. Me, Lily, and Moku get to sleep indoors every night. I don't miss sleeping on the cold hard ground. I like beds and pillows. Um, and, and just that simple point of just like, you know, the, the, you have to be realistic about this as well. That just being like, I suppose, purely like idealistic about this is like, no, you can make money from the thing you're passionate about, but I suppose it's about finding some sort of a balance. Um, and, and I do sort of appreciate that as, um, you know, the, the, as a theme, like, across this book. Um, so the, the next one I have marked is just, again, later on in the book. Yeah, Chang ends up talking about how, you know, like, it's, it's not great that kids have to do, perform in underground, underground bending tournaments to sort of make a living and stuff like that. And Toph is just like... I yell at my students too, but I also really care about them. I want them to do well. I built a safe place where young benders can develop their skills so they don't have to fight in underground bending tournaments the way I did. And Chong is kind of impressed with, you know, with her about this. Um, I suppose while we're here, this is the bending fight I was talking about earlier on between uh, Sun and the big water bending guy. Again, I, I love the art. I think it's really nicely done. It's just... Again, if only the fight was a little bit more meaningful. But again, when he gets to doing the lava bending, I think it looked really good as well. And that's why I would have really liked to see this book actually go into Toph trying to train a lava bender. That to me is a much more interesting dynamic than anything else this book covers in my mind. Um, so there's that. Uh, and then the final point is basically the sort of ending sort of note for the book. Um, which... 
I think this is perhaps where it's a little bit weaker, and this was the weakness with Guitar and the Pirate Silver as well, as much as like, you know, okay, it's telling its own one-shot story, you still have to end the book effectively, and, and I don't think they did there in terms of any sort of resolution, and here is again the sort of, you know, problem. My job is taking care of my students at the academy to make sure they're safe, they're learning uh, to master their bending abilities. Also, kid, I'm the first bender in forever who came up with a brand new type of bending. You might not have invented lava bending, but it's rare and special. And I want to be the one to teach you to be a real lava bender. So she offers them the opportunity to join the school here. She says that, you know, we've got the best teachers here possible, referring to Hotun, Penga, and the Dark One. Um, and that they really do like being teachers, which is nice. So... Son and his uh, friends join the academy because the other thing offered here is, like Chong said, they'll have a bed to sleep on doing things here. They won't need to worry as much about money because Toph has lots of funding for her academy. Really, really good stuff. And then the book ends with the reveal that um, actually, trustfully in love, Chong's band they're not going to be making money anymore. They're just gonna going back to their nomadic ways. Um, and you're kind of questioning, like, isn't that a bit of a contradiction? Doesn't Chong want to still sleep on a bed every night? And we get the reveal that he used some of his money to buy sort of, you know, like a traveling, you know, an Avatar wor <laughs> world version of like a kind of camper van type thing. So it's got beds in there. This way they can be nomadic. They can do what they want. They can choose to, you know, pay for a sh make a paid for show whenever they need to but they can also just be nomadic again and do things for the love of the music so you know that's the resolution and then we just end with you know well let's get back to school um so yeah th th that's the, the the core of this book and again like it's fine it's fun I feel like I say this about like most of the Avatar comics but that like that is the bare minimum I expect from one of these comics is that like, we shouldn't be massively praising these books solely because they achieved the bare minimum. And I think that that was the problem with Katara the Pirate Silver. It was the problem with Imbalance as well, to a degree, is just that you have to actually do something of note. That there's a sort of responsibility with these comics, I think, at this point, too. You are telling the story at this point in time, because it doesn't seem like anyone else is. Um, why is there an unwillingness to tell anything of note here? And that's just the way I feel about this comic, is that it's it's fine. Like, this book is like a very average 6 out of 10. This book is, I think, being generous, a 7 out of 10, but realistically more like a 6.5 out of 10. An improvement over Katara, but not by that much. In that I, I don't think they quite do as much as they perhaps should, because 72 pages is a lot of pages of comic. You can do quite a bit with that, doing a one-shot story where you focus in on one character. And I don't really think they did all that much here. In that, okay, we now know a little bit of a different approach to the Academy. It's not just for metal benders, it's also just to help uh, bender kids out. And I like that connection to Toph's past. That was nice to see. But how does that get us anywhere near Korra? And, and I think that's the major problem at this point, is that we are now 13 years on from the end of Avatar, and we are still no closer to getting any content with the characters when they're, like, adults, and truly properly bridging the gap to uh, Korra. We still seem to be utterly locked into keeping the characters in the same general age range, and not really telling the important stories. Um, there's tons of potential with these one-shots to do stuff like that. And I've talked about it before in terms of, like, Aang finding other Sky Bison, which, like, it has to happen at some point. Zuko and Drok, those type of things where, like, in the grand scheme of things, like, is a main story going to be focused on that? Perhaps not. But why not in a one-shot tell something like that? Um, again, the Suki book look, looks like it's going to be a big improvement, and then we'll see where they go after this. I'm guessing we are definitely going to get another trilogy of one-shots, but we don't really know. Because Mike and Brian said they were going to work on Avatar when they left the Netflix show, and we have not seen the result of that really outside of, you know, some sketches that I think they were doing anyway for charity that are now going to be in the art books, and Brian working on, like, new covers for the new art books. But, like, what's Mike doing? 
is it the new core comic or what? Like, we, we don't actually know. So there, there, there's, there's things like that going on of just that, like, probably the main problem with this book is just the timing of its release. This should be a very hype release in that it's happening at a time when things are going quite well for Avatar outside of the story content, and it's not really the story content that we need. Like I said with Guitar and the Pirate Silver, these comics would be fine in addition to mainline comics, but as a replacement for mainline comics, they are not good enough. And that's the, the short of it, I think. Um, they're, they're, they are not good enough to replace the likes of The Promise, The Search, The Rift, Smoke and Shadow, North and South, and Imbalance. The, these comics, even though I, I, I didn't think Imbalance was that great, Imbalance is a lot more impactful than what we've had here. So, we're making progress. We've improved from Qatar and the Pirate Silver, which I think was just a series of bad decisions about like what exactly not to do with these stories, and it looks like Suki will be better again going into the future when we open the door to like okay we were sort of locked into female characters for this one okay what next there's still a demand for azula there will probably be a demand for Sokka at some point you know will they do a one shot about ang and zuko do they need to when they're such heavy main characters i'm not really sure but what next after that and i think that's just the, the frustration here is that they're they basically officially communicated to us that you are not going to see a continuation post imbalance until we decide to do it. Are we just stuck right now spinning our wheels with these stories that aren't really advancing things in, in the sense that like, what is the point of doing the development you've done here for the characters if you can't go on past imbalance? That we can do all the setup in the world at this point in time, but it means nothing if you don't ever go on to construct the middle section of the bridge. And um, th th that's the, the, the major problem that we have here. So uh, I'm going to wrap it up here because again, there will be the podcast review, which I'm hoping will be over the weekend. I haven't heard back from Greg yet, but it probably will be this weekend, Saturday or Sunday. Um, so we'll be talking about the book in more depth when the podcast review happens and that we'll do more of a sort of a page by page analysis. This was meant to be more of a sort of general uh, discussion based on the fact that I had talked about the core of the book in my non-spoiler review and this was just covering some of the, uh, the other details in a little bit uh, more depth. So um, they're my thoughts on this book, just a still rather average book an improvement over the previous one shot but still not quite what we want not made any helpful by the timing of things but still we need to improve with the comics dark horse need to improve their communication still and they need to improve just choosing stories story direction we need to know what's happening with the story direction of the comics because it feels like we are lost at this point absolutely lost but uh yeah they're my thoughts on this book in the comments let me know what your thoughts were on toff bay fong's metal bending academy but that's been the video thanks for watching and bye